Trench warfare, the Salem witch trials, doping scandals in sports, they're all completely unrelated events, right? Well, it turns out that psychologists have created a thought game, and it helps to explain the decisions that people have made in these exact situations. Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium, and in this episode of Perspectives, four experts share how the prisoner's dilemma can apply to more than just criminal behavior. We start now with the rules of the prisoner's dilemma and just how complicated those rules become when people's sense of self-preservation gets involved. Enjoy. The prisoner's dilemma is a situation in which two people are given a choice of whether to cooperate or defect. Mutual cooperation will get the overall best result, but since individually defection is in their best interest, they will defect and actually get the worst possible result. I know that may seem a little confusing, so let's consider a particular case. So, two prisoners are suspected of a crime. If they both keep quiet, they will get only one year in jail. If each squeals on the other, they will get four years each. But if one squeals and the other doesn't, the squealer goes free, and the other gets six years. Notice that for each person, it is better to defect no matter what the other person does. Say you're person A. If you think person B is going to squeal, then you should squeal too. If person B squeals and you don't, you'll get six years. But if you squeal too, you only get four. But if you think he's going to cooperate, you should still squeal. If you both cooperate, you'll still get a year, but if you squeal and they don't, then you get nothing. So again, regardless of what the other person does, it's better for you to defect, to squeal. Of course, the same is true for person B in the scenario. No matter what person A does, it's better to defect. So both will defect. But notice, that's the worst possible overall result. If they both defected collectively, they will serve eight years. If only one defected, there would only be six years served total. And if they both just cooperated, they'd only get two collectively. Stunningly, guilt and innocence do not matter in the context of this game. The payoffs are the same whether or not the players are guilty, so both players still have a dominant strategy to confess. And that's not only true in games. Legal history is full of examples of people confessing to crimes they didn't commit because confessing would guarantee them a lighter sentence. We can see this going back at least as far as the Salem witch trials in the 1690s. 19 people, most of them women, were hanged, and one more was crushed by stones. But these weren't the only Salem residents accused of witchcraft. They were the ones who didn't confess to witchcraft once they had been accused. According to The Economist News Magazine, quote, perversely pleading innocent tended to bring a death sentence, whereas those who confessed were spared. Some who pleaded guilty to survive felt awful remorse for lying, end quote. Today, we know they must have been lying, so you can understand why they'd feel remorse. But I hope you can also understand why they confess, given the incentives they faced were so similar to those from the Prisoner's Dilemma game. This prisoner's dilemma was proposed by Merrill Flood and Melvin Drescher in 1950. If you play it once, well, we've analyzed that. Each, decide, each decides to confess. And if they both confess, they each get two years. But if you play it repeatedly, that gets really interesting. And one of the reasons it's interesting is that it becomes a model for interaction between organisms. You can think of confessing as cooperating, maybe helping other organisms gather food. And you can think of denying as competing, hoarding your food and not sharing it. Now, two organisms working together, that's best. And two organisms each working separately, that's usually not as good. You know, if I help you gather food, then you hoard it. I lose badly. This is sometimes called an iterated prisoner's dilemma if we play this again and again and again. You can see why decision researchers might like this game. It's simple, elegant, and it measures something interesting and relevant. And you can very easily change it in all kinds of ways to test slightly different things. Do the people know each other before the game? Do they know they'll have to interact after the game? 
Does the gender of each participant matter? What about people from different cultures or ages or backgrounds? The BBC even created a game show based on the prisoner's dilemma called Golden Balls, in which players each had to decide individually and in secret whether to split a pot of money or try to steal it from the other player. This game show, built around this single solitary decision, cooperate or defect, produced surprising amounts of drama. When psychologists and behavioral economists use the prisoner's dilemma, they usually don't use the story of the two thieves. Instead, like the game show, they set it up as a cooperation game that involves cash payouts. The game for both groups involved payouts that met the prisoner's dilemma criteria. That is, if both players cooperated, that would result in the highest group payout. If one player cooperated and the other defected, the defecting player would get the highest possible payout, and the attempted cooperator would get the lowest possible payout. And if both players decided to defect, that would result in the lowest group payout. Given a detailed explanation of the game, and exactly what the payoffs would be in each situation, people were faced with a simple choice. Do I cooperate or do I defect? If you trust your partner, the smart move is to cooperate. If you doubt your partner, the smart move is to defect. In this experiment, the only difference between these two groups was what the game was called. For half of the participants, it was called the community game. For the other half, it was called the Wall Street game. I'm sure you can already see where this is going. When it was called the community game, 67% of participants ended up choosing to cooperate. When it was called the Wall Street game, the percentage of participants choosing to cooperate dropped all the way down to 33%. Doing nothing more than changing the name of the game was enough to reduce the likelihood of cooperating from two-thirds to one-third. Now, because we're doing this iteratively, there are many co complicated strategies that are possible. I could cooperate every time, every other time. My next move next time could depend on yours this time. You could ask, what's a good strategy here? And in 1984, Robert Axelrod wrote about a tournament where computer programmers were asked to code strategies and, we had, and they had those strategies compete against each other. Some of these computer programmers came up with incredibly complicated strategies. Interestingly, these greedy strategies where there's a lot of confessing, competing, they didn't do very well. The winning strategy was also the simplest strategy, and it's called tit for tat. It beat all of the others. It goes like this. In the first game, you cooperate, you confess. And then the next game, you do what, the op what your opponent did the last time. If he chose to cooperate, you cooperate too. You're nice. I can be nice too. If he chose to compete, you compete too. You're greedy, I can be greedy too. They went head to head, they competed against different algorithms, and this strategy, tit for tat, beat all of the other algorithms. Axelrod wrote this up in a book called Evolution of Cooperation. This answered an age-old question. If organisms, are, and maybe even corporations, if they're greedy and they want to survive and profit, why do they ever cooperate? And the answer here is that greed is sometimes not the best long-term strategy. In cases where these organisms interact repeatedly, repeatedly, it might not be in their best interest to be greedy. It might be better in their better long-term interest to cooperate. It's a simple strategy, but it's incredibly effective at establishing and then maintaining cooperation in a repeated prisoner's dilemma. That's why the Allied generals hated it. The Allies had more soldiers, so from the standpoint of Allied high command, a battle where 10,000 died on each side was a victory. From the general standpoint, the equilibrium outcome from the one-time game was a good outcome. If you were a general back at headquarters, how would you break out of the cooperative tit-for-tat equilibrium? Perhaps you could rotate troops frequently. The problem is that troops talk to one another as they're being rotated. The old guard tells the new guard, the Germans aren't so bad. You don't shoot them, they won't shoot you. 
Or perhaps you could ask soldiers to bring back battlefield souvenirs like German barbed wire, proving they'd gotten out of their trenches and attacked the Germans. The problem this time is that Allied soldiers managed to find entire rolls of German barbed wire, making it easy for them to send back a few feet at a time. What the generals finally settled on were corpses. They knew that if the Allied soldiers really raided the German trenches, there would be corpses, either Allied corpses or German corpses, and the generals insisted on seeing them. It was these small but relentless Allied raids, followed by the retaliation you'd expect from Germans playing tit-for-tat, that caused cooperation to break down and fighting to resume. This, of course, is heartbreaking, but it shows how powerfully effective a simple strategy like tit-for-tat can be. Always begin by cooperating. Stand up for yourself when people cheat you, but be quick to forgive if they go back to cooperating. And finally, to quote Axelrod, don't be too clever. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about any of the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch all the full series now on Wondrium.com. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Turn on notifications and you'll get an alert every time we post a new episode of Perspectives.